The China Global South podcast is supported in part by the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg and by our subscribers. Thank you. If you'd like to subscribe for daily news and exclusive analysis about every aspect of China's engagement in Africa, Asia, and throughout the developing world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com forward slash subscribe. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China Global South podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Podcast Network. I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. And as always, I'm joined by China Global South's managing editor, Kobus van Staden, in Berlin, Germany, for another two weeks, I think. A good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, uh, first, before we get started, I want to give a huge shout out to everybody at the China Project and the organizers of the next China conference that took place last week in New York, and they were gracious enough to bring me out. It was just so much fun to see everybody and to meet some of my heroes in real life. You know, after all these years, 15 years of doing this podcast and knowing Kaiser and Jeremy at the Seneca podcast, never met them in person until last week. And that was a small thrill, I have to say, but they put on an absolutely amazing conference. And Kobus, I have to tell you, in the China watching community in the United States, you have a lot of fans. What? Everybody was coming <laughs> up to me to say, where's Kobus? Say hi to Kobus. So people were sending <laughs> you a lot of love in New York. So that was a lot of fun. Also, very quickly, for those of you in Johannesburg, the China Global South team is going to be there for the African Investigative Journalism Conference. Jiro is going to be there in Jenga. Kobus and myself. Uh, so if you are in Johannesburg, send us a note, kind of flag us on LinkedIn or Twitter or send us an email. You can find our email all over the place. We'd love to see you. We might even do a meetup. We're thinking about that. But uh, if you're in Johannesburg, please do let us know. Okay, Kobus, here we are again. And this is going to be the last time that we're going to talk about this issue for what I hope will be a very long time. But the debt trap from the United States is back in the news again. Uh, U.S. President Joe Biden, he hosted the inaugural America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity Leaders Summit. And that was where he got together with 11 other leaders from the Western Hemisphere. That includes Canada, countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. And at that session, he read some prepared remarks that include a veiled reference to China. Over the last year and a half, everyone has stepped up and we've stepped up together. And the initiatives we're announcing today speak to the progress we've already made and the potential of the America's partnership going forward. We're doubling down on mobilizing financial solutions in the Americas. The United States is already the largest source of investment across Latin America and the Caribbean by far. And we want to make sure that our closest neighbors know they have a real choice between debt trap diplomacy and high quality, transparent approaches to infrastructure and to development. There you have it. That's the reference to debt trap diplomacy, that despite the fact that the State Department at the operational level has stopped using that reference at the senior level, both in the government itself, the Pentagon, as well as in the legislature, uh, is still very commonly used by many senior U.S. stakeholders. Kobus, we dedicated a lot of our newsletter today to this issue, in part because we wanted to almost write the final word on this for us. Uh, this has been about 10 years since the narrative has been around. Over the past five or six years, any number of the highest quality research institutions in the United States, in Europe, and even here in Southeast Asia have done extensive studies into China's lending practices, and they have found a number of problems with it. What they did not find was the debt trap narrative and the meme as it's been laid out by the United States. So just to be clear to remind everybody, what the United States is saying when they promote the debt trap idea is that the Chinese are intentionally using loans as a way to load up a vulnerable country and so that they can later on either exert political influence over that country or to even extract concessions in the form of, according to the narrative, not according to facts here, in the form of either assets or even territory. 
We have seen extensive research by Professor Deborah Bradogum at Johns Hopkins University. Boston University's Global Development Policy Center has done work on this. A data at William and Mary, Chatham House in London. Uh, the list goes on here. The uh, there's an, a, an institute in Singapore that's done a lot of research on lending in Southeast Asia, and all of them we detailed in today's newsletter. Excerpts of it are available on the first page of a Google search under the words China debt trap. And so it begs the question that if this is available on the first page of a Google search and the United States is continuing to use it, and remember, he did this in prepared remarks. So this was not an off-the-cuff comment that he just kind of winged. Someone at the National Security Council or on the presidential staff wrote a speech, included that in the talking points, and then included that into the actual final script. Kobus, you wrote about this in the column for today's newsletter. You also wrote about how it damages U.S. foreign policy that the United States continues to talk about this. What say you? I do think it damages U.S. foreign policy because it makes it look like good quality information is not reaching the president. It also makes it look like they are stuck in so stuck in narratives that it's impossible for them to move. You know, and and that and that then confirms a, a view that that we know is 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 a pre prevalent problem in the U.S. Like I, I looked at a recent CNN poll that that found that 69 percent of Republicans still believe that the 2020 election was illegitimate. So you know, kind of so so we know that the these narratives are now kind of settling in, you know, kind of in a semi-permanent semi way within the U.S. system. And it makes it look like that's also true for the U.S. foreign policy. More problematic even than that, I think, is that it essentially sends the message that the main thing that a lot of Global South stakeholders want, which is reform of the global financial system and at least some kind of acknowledgement of how broken the global financial system is, particularly as, you know, climate change is barreling down on us, is not going to come from the U.S. Like the U.S. isn't interested in global financial reform, that they're, in, that they're happy with the system as, the, as it is, and that they are therefore kind of willing to gaslight people a little bit in order to make them play ball. That is essentially the, the, the message that I'm seeing from it. And then what I think is even more, you know, kind of problematic after that is that it then feeds into a huge conversation in the global south around this 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 kind of theme of Western double standards. I mean, you can have a thousand hours of conversation in the global south by just shouting Western double standards on the side of the street and then letting people go, you know? And this is happening particularly in, you know, in the same week as first the US kicked out a bunch of African countries from the African Growth and Opportunity Act, you know, for very solid reasons, you know, coups and a horrifying anti-LGBT kind of legislation in Uganda. But it's not taking into account that a a lot of similar issues are happening in the US, like on the LGBT side particularly, but it's also not taking into account that all of this is happening while the US is also providing a lot of cover for Israel in what is increasingly becoming an extremely problematic situation in Palestine. You know, so the global south is increasingly kind of cohering around this kind of narrative of U.S. slash Western double standards, and nobody is playing into that more than China. China is leaning into that. That is increasingly becoming China's like core foreign policy, you know, prerogative or not prerogative, like, like kind of paradigm, you know, kind of through which it engages with the rest of the world. And this debt trap kind of little slip in just strengthens that. Yeah, it was a, a real passing remark. And so, Kobus, just to pick up on some of your your references that you made in your column today, we asked the question is if is that if it's so easily accessible to find out what's really going on regarding Chinese lending in the global south and in developing countries, how is it possible that this kind of information is making it into a president's speech? And we identified three possibilities. Again, no one really knows. Maybe they do know, but they're not saying publicly. But we we looked at three things. Number one, is that it's an accepted truth. We wrote that the sky is blue, grass is green, and China's a predatory lender. That's just the common wisdom now in Washington, and there's no nuance to that understanding. 
And so when he says it, everybody in Washington goes, yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. And so that doesn't raise any flags. No one even bothers to check Google or to check what Boston University has written or what Deborah Braudigam said or what Chatham House has said or the fact that it's not backed up by any evidence. It's just an accepted truth. Another one, and this is what you referenced, is that it's bureaucratic paralysis. We know from some of our conversations with U.S. government stakeholders that at the operational level, they are no longer using this reference. The people who are on the ground doing a lot of the work have, say, have said, yeah, this isn't a thing. They've communicated that back to Washington, but it's not making it up the chain of command. And that shows a rigidity in the policymaking process. This shows a policymaking infrastructure that is incapable of adapting to new information and new realities. Interestingly, this was a point that Kishore Mabubani, the former Singaporean and, uh, ambassador to the United Nations, wrote in one of his books that the U.S. policymaking process is so rigid now that it can't adapt. And I think this is a good example of that. When new data comes in, it can't pivot because we have been on this talking point since Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. I was in the DRC when that happened, when she was saying those things about the Chinese all the way back a decade ago. And then the last one, and Kobus, this comes from you, and I'd like to get your take on this, that at some point, whether it's because of intentional or ignorance, it becomes misinformation, okay? When the information about the debt trap is so readily available, again, on the first page of a Google search results, and the United States continues to say this thing, then it's either intentional or inadvertent misinformation. And that fundamentally undermines the United States when they accuse China of being a malign actor trafficking in misinformation. And so when General Michael Langley, the head of AFRICOM, is testifying before Congress as he did back in March and saying the debt trap, whether it's legislators on the Hill who then put these resolutions up saying they want to combat Chinese debt trap diplomacy or now the president, it becomes an act of misinformation when it's blatantly not true. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it becomes one of these moments where there's a kind of a consensus in the US. Everyone, you know, kind of the, the government, the press, everyone kind of like plays ball and coheres around that that talking point, And then it kind of becomes kind of real. But the problem is, is that it isn't real. And it isn't, and, and, and the US doesn't have that kind of unipolar global power to set discourses anymore. You know, there's an internet, there's counter narratives. And so it just kind of makes them look, well, you know, it's, 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 it's difficult to, to, to know how cynical to be about it, but what it, it kind of makes them look like, like they know they're lying and they don't care that you know they're lying. <laughs> you know, it kind of like, it, 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 it gives that feeling of, of like, well, what are you going to do? You know, <laughs> like, well, <laughs> um, but the thing is, what people are going to do is they're going to work with China, <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, but, but think about the room that he was in with 11 other leaders from the Caribbean, Latin America, and South America, who all ha have extensive business ties with China, who all have taken, for the most part, loans from China. Again, none of the evidence of the debt trap narrative exists, so they are thinking to themselves, well, this hasn't happened in my country, and I haven't heard of it happening in another country. And ultimately, I think it makes the United States lose credibility because those leaders know f firsthand that this isn't true. Yes. And so when the Americans are saying this, they are actually communicating to developing world leaders that you're so stupid that you've done these deals with the Chinese and got hoodwinked by them and gotten taken advantage of them. That's why you got in, you know, sucked into predatory lending. And now, let's be clear here. All of the research that we've cited as disproving the debt trap also highlights the role that corruption, malfeasance, and incompetence played in a lot of Chinese lending. It's just not the debt trap narrative. But the thing is also is that all, if if I'm correct, also in that room, Mia Motley was also in that room, right? The president of, of of Barbados. That's right, Prime Minister of Barbados. And she's one of the like the world's most prominent critics of development finance 
systemic or of the of the development finance system particularly as it relates to climate at the moment and uh, you know kind of a real kind of like a global kind of thought leader on how these systems should be should be uh, reformed so you know she more than anyone knows that the reason these countries work with china and the reason why they frequently take bad deals from china is because they don't have any other options and it's because the global financial system is so broken that china is frequently the best option of a bunch of bad options so so for her to kind of just be sitting in that room <laughs> hearing the debt trap thing go by you know like in the first place, I mean, she can't be surprised because she's been in that room before. But also, the message it sends is, we know what your problems are and we don't care. We'd prefer to raise other fake problems rather than discuss your actual problems. And, and you know, like, as, as, a, as a leader of a global South country, you really don't need to hear more than that. <laughs> that's, that's the core message, you know. So I think, you know, you and I were talking before the show that this is getting boring as a story because there's no change in it, that the United States has been saying this for 10 years. And despite the fact that we know we have a lot of listeners within the U.S. government, some very high, and the fact that a lot of the people who have published this data from BU, aid data elsewhere, also have very high level engagements with U.S. government officials, they don't seem to be listening. So... Who I mean, okay, this is going to go on for another 10 years. And so it's really, at that point, it stops being news anymore. So I'm not entirely sure how much more we're going to cover. And this is, we kind of wrote today's newsletter almost that this was the final word from us on this particular situation. And we're just going to move on to other stories because uh, unless it becomes a really big news story, because it just, this is what it is and this is the way it's going to be. So it's not really going to change. Again, one of the other aspects of what Biden said was this reference to high quality infrastructure. And this seems to be another critique of the Chinese. Again, more room to maneuver here because Chinese infrastructure throughout many parts of the developing world in many ways does have a mixed reputation in terms of the impact on local communities, on labor, and also on the quality itself. Now, it's too simple to put all of the blame on the Chinese contractor or the Chinese financier for the shortcomings in some of these projects. These projects are extraordinarily complex. There is a lot of host governance issues that are also involved in this. The host government is oftentimes in charge of the environmental regulations, the implementation of them, enforcement of labor codes. So simply to blame the Chinese for everything Uh, oftentimes is very, very reductive and not very sophisticated in terms of the understanding of it. But there's a fascinating new report, Kobus, that you helped actually to contribute to. So in this, today's show is going to be a little bit weird where you're going to be both a key guest on it, but also a key contributor to it and the questioner of it. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to join your discussion, but you joined some of your colleagues in the research on this report that was produced. And it's a long list. Bear with me here. And this is what makes the report so interesting when you hear the different parties who are involved. Uh, BU's Global Development Policy Center, Fudan University's Green Finance and Development Center, uh, the South African Institute of International Affairs, LS, LSE ideas, and all of them worked together to do some research on what was a consistent ESG framework to analyze the risk and impacts of five China-funded infrastructure projects in Egypt, Nigeria, and Ethiopia, specifically focused on the energy and industrial park sectors. And uh, maybe just before we get into the discussion, you can give us the high-level introduction and overview to this report. So the report essentially wanted to try and and look at how effective the implementation of ESG principles. So this is environmental, social and governance, you know, standards have been in Chinese projects in these three countries. And it was aimed to find sectors where it could compare the, the implementation and it wanted to see you know, A, how effective the implementation around these issues have been, 
And then what were some of the problems? Like in the cases where it, it wasn't so, so well implemented, kind of where, where did that fall down? And so it looked at, you know, it, it, it focused on, on electricity transmission networks um, and on special economic zones. And it found that, um, that it's, it's very much a mixed, a mixed bag. There, there were kind of good outcomes, bad outcomes um, along all, all three of these, of these issues. But in, in, a, in some cases, the, the bad outcomes came through kind of problematic interactions between different stakeholders. So it, you, you couldn't 100% kind of like lump it with, with either the Chinese contractors or with, the, with the, the local governments. It was frequently more out of the, the kind of interactions between a bunch of different stakeholders. And in, in some cases, you know, kind of where, where it was also problematic, it was problematic in ways that fall slightly out us outside of the ESG framework. So, so it then raises questions about, about yeah, like ESG is of course very important, but, but from the, the recipient government side, there's also the issue of wanting to increase employment, for example, right? Um, so, so it's not only an issue issue of, of how well this, these kind of standards were implemented. It was also an issue of, of whether it actually created jobs. And which then is, you know, puts a slight, like it, it means that, that, you know, people like, for example, the European Union is very, very obsessed with ESG standard setting. So they come from it from a slightly different place than, say, the recipient governments, you know. So, so it also then becomes a, a, a kind of a discussion of whose standards should count and how could, do we pull everyone kind of on board, you know, kind of to make sure these projects work better. So in addition to COBUS, there were a number of other of the heavy hitters really in the China Africa research space who contributed to this report. Our friend Professor Chris Alden at the London School of Economics, uh, Ke Tang, who is a global China postdoctoral research fellow at BU, and then Cecilia Han Springer, who was previously the assistant director of the Global China Initiative at the Global Development Policy Center and is now a principal at Global Efficiency Intelligence in Washington, D.C., and our old friend of the show, Christoph Nedepil, the founding director of the Green Finance and Development Center at Fudan University and now director of the Griffith Asia Institute at Griffith University in Brisbane, Australia. Kobus, that was a mouthful, all of those different names. But you, you know, we had a chance to again speak with Cecilia and Christoph to dive into the report. Let's take a listen now to Kobus's conversation with Cecilia Hanspringer and Christoph Nedepel. Christoph and Cecilia, thanks so much for joining me. It's so cool to speak with you. Maybe we can kick off with just kind of setting the scene a little bit. You know, kind of ESG or like environmental, social and governance impacts of projects have become a kind of a buzzword over the last few years, but it's also become a political target to a certain extent. There's been kind of anti-ESG campaigning, you know, particularly, you know, on the Republican side in the US, for example. So, um, Cecilia, I wonder if you could just kind of give us a kind of a temperature check in terms of where are we in ESG implementation and thinking in the world broadly? Thanks, Kobus. Yeah, I think right now is a very sensitive time for ESG. I think the idea of focusing on environmental, social and governance standards and investment initially, you know, has enjoyed a lot of uptake and is now a very mainstream concept. But of course, with exposure comes some pushback. So as you mentioned, here in the US, a lot of critics are saying that ESG motivated investing, it's more political than based on sound business or investment decisions. And not only that, but there have been some controversies around how difficult it really is to measure whether or not a project or even a portfolio is performing up to standard. And so there are some political concerns, and then there are some sort of legitimate related measurement concerns, which is one of the reasons why we delved into the research that we did about Chinese ESG investments in Africa. But theoretically, I think, you know, the idea of ESG can help investors screen projects, can help create standards that improve outcomes. But at the moment, it's become at a high level, a very troubled concept in many places. And, you know, just to give a little bit of context for the project, I wonder if you could like just outline, you know, which countries we looked at and what the particular kind of questions that we asked. <laughs> 
Sure. So the motivation for this project was looking specifically at Chinese investments in African countries and to what extent they were performing in terms of their ESG practices relative to the risks that they were facing. So to boil it down, are development projects financed by China and Africa meeting stated ESG guidelines? And so this is of course, very difficult to do across an extremely diverse continent. And so what we did was we focused on a couple of countries and a couple of sectors where there is a very large concentration of Chinese investment. And so those countries were Egypt, Nigeria, and Ethiopia. And we also looked at two sectors, the energy sector and then industrial parks. And our rationale behind this was that energy is, you know, looking across sectors, the largest destination for China's infrastructure finance. And then industrial parks represent kind of the manufacturing sector. We were looking to get a little bit more specific than just manufacturing in general, but obviously industrial parks can hold a wide range of different kinds of manufacturing activities, and they're also specifically highlighted by many countries as, you know, areas where there's sort of a concentrated focus on development, economic development, special economic zone, and so on. And so you'll see that um, we focused on a couple of special economic zones as our case studies. So by having these case studies across countries and sectors, we were able to get at our big question of overall kind of ESG performance, a more granular level. And Christoph, when one speaks with some Western policymakers and other stakeholders, it's easy to get the impression that there's zero interest, you know, in China in, on ESG issues at all. You know, but but you've been personally also involved as, you know, kind of in, in your work in, in helping to shape some of those standards in China. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where China is ESG-wise. Like, what has been the evolution of ESG standards, particularly focusing on, on, on kind of overseas outward-facing projects? First of all, it's great to be back and uh, I think also great to be here with you, Kobus and Cecilia. So the question, I think, is also very good. China has been criticized for years and particularly since the Belt and Road Initiative was initiated in 2013 about poor environmental and social and governance standards. And particularly at the beginning, it was very much related to environment, climate pollution through its coal-fired power plants, social aspects of employment or relocation, forced relocation of people um, in order to get projects done. And in terms of governance issues, corruption was one of the big sore points, I think, from, from a Western perspective. Over the years, I must say there has been a lot of improvements, also on, on the whole ESG front. The uh, drive against corruption within China has also very much affected its outward engagement. So talking with stakeholders in China kind of almost blindly and naively me asking it's like yeah so you get the deals done sometimes also you know with a good handshake and it's like yeah no you know things have really changed and it's not to say that kind of on the governance issues that everything is rosy and sometimes it's also very difficult to do business in some of the countries that China is doing business with where um, the local legal situation is not as clear and there is of course collusion between the elites so I think everything kind of is on an ideally improving path, but we're not there yet in terms of governance and um, that everything is clean, but it's clearly a drive for the Chinese side. Also in terms of the environmental aspects, a lot of improvements have been made. We had, and I think uh, we had talked about this before, we had previously for the first years, of course, always this idea, let's build a green BRI. And there was a lot of policy documents that lined out that green BRI is very cool, but the implementation guidelines were absolutely missing. And uh, the definition of what it actually means to be green were missing. And that left a huge gap where Chinese companies were allowed to use local standards um, for environment. And if you have, again, very weak institutional environments in some of the BRI countries, that meant that Pretty much there was no environmental law in place, or at least not implemented. And over the years, China has come up with significant guidelines for enterprises, for financial institutions to understand 
first of all, what is green? Um, so the traffic light system has allowed us to understand better what is green. The guidelines also specify kind of when it's being applied in, in project finance. So really throughout the whole project from the initiation to the planning of a project, where ideally an environmental and social impact assessment is made, um, implementation and also decommissioning. And then there's also now guidelines being developed and they have not been endorsed, but this is something that both is developed domestically even more, but also for overseas is disclosure. So what does it actually mean kind of to talk to a broader public of the environmental performance? And I think there's there's still some gap and I mean, we have gaps everywhere, but in the disclosure, probably we have the largest gap. But overall, I think the dynamic is rather positive than negative. That's very interesting. And so with all of this regulation and guidelines coming out, how are those interacting with recipient country regulations? Because in the past, there was always this idea that essentially Chinese companies just conform to or make it work kind of like in, in whatever kind of regulatory environment they find themselves in. Has that shifted a little bit now that there's more of these kind of proactive guidelines coming out? Right. So the original idea was really kind of this host country principle. As long as you comply with host country standards, everything is fine. And the financial institution can sign off that all of the environmental standards are met. And that is mostly a legal due diligence. So from a legal perspective, all of the local laws have been met. It's not a real environmental risk management perspective. And environmental risk management ideally means that the project developer and the financial institution, both often from China, understand what are actually the environmental risks. So you have to get out there, understand, okay, here are environmental risks, there's water pollution, there's air pollution, and so on. How do we manage it? What is our management plan? It's not about the license from the local government that in general you have done something, but really for the company and the, for the financial institution to understand how do we manage these risks that we have identified. And there has been a shift in the Chinese mind that it's really not just about legal compliance, but about risk management. Again, this is a shift that uh, I think is still uh, not complete. We have had the first guidelines that stipulated that China needs to apply more than host country laws in 2020. So that was the first time that China mentioned this. And in 2021 and 2022, this was reinforced. So again, it's very similar to international standards, so the equator principles um, that many international financial institutions have signed up to pretty much stipulates the same thing in countries with weak local environments. Don't just rely on the local laws, but apply international best practices in order to really manage environmental risks. International financial institutions are indeed a lot more developed in this regard, so there's catching up to do from the Chinese side, but the direction is the right one. And Cecilia, on the ground, how, and, and judging by the study that we're discussing, how has that worked? Like, you know, because from reading the report and obviously, you know, kind of, you know, th through my own, my own process of, of working on it, so full disclosure for everyone, like all three of us are working on this report in different capacities. So we were all kind of looking at different parts of it at different times. A Christ cut a kind of a long extended timeline. So, you know, kind of we're all coming from both inside and outside, basically. So Cecilia, in, in, in terms of looking how all of this kind of landed in the case study, countries like what, what are your impressions of how advanced ESG kind of implementation and regulation are in those countries and then how how the interactions with these Chinese actors actually happened Yes. First of all, very important also to acknowledge that Cobus is a critical co-author in this report, and it was great to do the research together as a team. <laughs> but yeah, I think it really comes down to what Christoph was saying. I think it's important to underscore that China is increasingly reaching an international standard in terms of setting out ambitious ESG guidelines, and that's been a major development over the past few years, a very short time period relative to some of the other investors that you might compare China against. But nevertheless, what's on paper, and we can talk more about some of those specific framework, is fairly comprehensive, though there is room for improvement. But the big problem, of course, is implementation. And so I think we went into this research and this project maybe quite optimistic. I don't know if you all would agree, but, you know, hoping to find positive case studies or sort of champions to highlight where guidelines were being followed or risks were being adequately cataloged and managed and so on. And it's not to say that our expectations were dashed or something, but these are incredibly complex, large, long-term 
infrastructure projects. And I think our findings from the sort of on the ground case studies showed that there was very much a mixed bag in terms of implementation. And so we used a consistent framework across all of the studies to try and evaluate what was happening and found looking at the different stages of project planning. As Christoph said, it's really important to look at planning, implementation, decommissioning, all of the phases of the project lifecycle. You know, some projects had very clearly documented issues on the environmental side, some more so on social, some more so on governance. And so, you know, I think and we mentioned we were going to look at special economic zones. And one thing that especially came up across some of the zones, especially in the lucky free zone, were issues with relocation and a lack of satisfaction from local stakeholders on relocation mechanisms, though they weren't necessarily taken into account in the early stages of the project nor during implementation, which led to a lot of social issues, you know, dissatisfaction with compensation, inability to communicate these issues to the relevant local stakeholders, much less to the Chinese and so on. So so that's just an example of some of the things that came up as we were doing this research. Yeah, absolutely. And and one of the things that really kind of echoed with a lot of other research that I've done and also that, that we've discussed on, on the podcast as well is that like relocation and land compensation is such a problem in these projects everywhere. You know, I found very similar kind of issues showing up in, in a different project I was doing that, that was focusing on Southeast Asia compared to Africa as well, which was where frequently very similar kind of complaints came up. So Christopher and, and Cecilia jump in, you know, kind of if I uh, Absolutely. Why do you think land compensation is such a kind of a fraught area for these projects? Like, and, uh, do you see that across both Chinese and other projects? Or is there, like, have some kind of international players found some kind of way of dealing with that problem? Also, as a note, it was really fun to work on this project altogether. It took us much longer um, for the listeners here, this project, than we originally anticipated. But the good thing is the team stayed very strong and it was actually quite fun for a longer time. So very happy about this. But the the question is good. I think there are probably the, the situation with relocation and compensation is always complex and kind of Probably there's not a simple answer, but I will try nevertheless to give one answer that I've heard a couple of times is that the expectation usually is that the relocation um, and compensation is done by the local authorities and not by the Chinese. This is also what's happening within China. If there is a factory being built or housing development being built, it is often within the responsibility of the government and not with the project developer to provide uh, relocation and then the compensation is also somehow dealt with by the local communities ideally directly. So in some ways many Chinese companies don't even want to get involved in kind of implementing any relocation and compensation plans but try to outsource that to whoever they think can implement it. And relocation and particularly then compensation for that is kind of just also unfortunately a very corrupt issue because then maybe one person in the local community um, has the responsibility to deal with the money and deal with the relocation and this person might not have the perfect incentives to distribute that fairly. So that has been at least in some of the projects that I've been also looking at um, one of the reasons why this relocation and compensation um, has been more difficult. Cecilia, is there ways in which, you know, particularly kind of foreign entities like Chinese companies, for example, is there are there ways that they can find to smooth that process along? Because so frequently, you know, with these these disputes, they are that, that kind of sets up the you know kind of a big fight with the local community, which can which can turn messy very quickly, you know, and which then is is frequently kind of spun in international media as a local community resists Chinese project, you know, frequently kind of like leaving out all of the different middlemen and, and government officials and so on who were also involved in the problem. Like, what are kind of ways that external actors can make their way around this issue? Yeah, it's a really tough question because, as you mentioned, you know, some of these Chinese investors may not 
have adequate mechanisms to deal with the relocation issue. And just even bigger picture, it's also important to point out that within China, domestically, a lot of their domestic infrastructure development has been very fraught with relocation and compensation issues. And so there's not necessarily, for example, a domestic model to draw from. But I think, you know, it really comes down to risk management and transparency and disclosure, as Christoph mentioned earlier. We think that even though it's an incredibly complex and difficult issue, not just for China, but for any um, investor in areas where land needs to be developed, I think, you know, there's more to be done, especially in terms of working with the local partner to establish their role in that process and then also make that more transparent, especially to the local stakeholders. I think one of the things that came up earlier is China's own emerging framework for um, overseas investments and reporting issues. And, you know, we've seen the establishment of this, I think, grievance mechanism is maybe the best way to call it. And that's still evolving, but just kind of a way for different stakeholders at the project level to report their concerns upwards to the level of, you know, Chinese investors and financial institutions. And so I think, you know, having those channels of communication open and then also making it known how to use them is going to be a really important step in the future. Yeah, I fully echo actually what you're saying, Cecilia. I think both transparency and the grievance mechanism, so stakeholder participation in this project development and project implementation phase is extremely important to get the buy-in and the trust uh, from the local communities. And there's a lot of, I think, steps that can be improved. The grievance mechanism has been in kind of in the discussion for a number of years now in China. The grievance mechanism, I think, f- for uh, some of the listeners that are not uh, familiar with it, means pretty much that the local stakeholders that are affected by this project can voice their anger, their problems that they encounter, ideally to the financing bank, that's one of the grievance mechanisms, or even to a central authority in China. That was the um, original idea. And this grievance mechanism is still not fully implemented. So there is not really a voice that the, the people can or kind of anger that they can voice to some higher authority except domestically or to the media. And then if it's uh, going to the media, the social unhappiness, the local unhappiness really becomes public. And this is ideally something that the um, developers, Chinese developers or international developers want to avoid because nobody wants to have bad headlines. One of the big balancing acts that one sees with these projects is the need, on the one hand, to be ESG responsive and to have good governance, but on the other hand, to actually also create employment. And that, you know, there's this very strong political pressure in recipient countries for these projects, particularly, you know, things like um, industrial parks, to actually attract investment and then particularly to translate into jobs on the ground. And in, in, all, in some of these cases, we've seen a mix of, like a kind of a mixed bag of, of results, where on the one hand, there were some jobs created, but then also there were some kind of lapses in labor law and a lot of like not necessarily very happy employment kind of created. So I was wondering in doing this kind of study, like how one weights those different concerns and how one should think about the employment and, and job kind of creation, you know, aspect of these projects in the frame of ESG. Yeah, so I think that you know, questions of employment and labor standards and so on, we sort of categorized into the social and to some extent governance parts of ESG. And while we didn't necessarily place more weight on one sort of criteria than another, I think it was really, really interesting what we found in some of the special economic zones. For example, when we were doing the case study in Egypt, the TEDA Suez special economic zone, which is a very large area and has been operating, I think, for longer than the other special economic zone that we were looking at. We found a mixed bag, as you mentioned, but also some potentially positive examples where local content requirements, so essentially setting the guideline that a certain number of workers had to be uh, local, and not only that, but they had to receive training in the event that this threshold ever dipped below what was needed. So building up a local workforce in order to meet that requirement, you know, had some positive impact and, you know, was was able to be carried forward. And at the same time, because the special economic zone is so large and, you know, there are lots of different companies operating there, this wasn't necessarily a universal standard across 
the zone. And so, you know, according to some interviews, there were issues with low wages and long working hours, lack of social insurance and, and so on. And, and this led to kind of high turnover rates and not the kind of stable jobs associated with, you know, broader economic growth that might be desirable for especially the Egyptian side of the project. So there were some positive examples based on specific companies, maybe maintaining better employment standards. And then there were also counter examples. So it is, you know, very complicated and plays out differently, you know, within a specific project within a specific zone. That being said, I think one of the really interesting things that this research and this report highlights is that at a very broad level, Chinese investment in Africa has brought benefits and risks. And so we kind of review studies that are maybe bigger picture than ours. You know, we were very case study focused, but looking across, you know, hundreds of projects and, um, kind of summarizing what we've learned about that, you know, we do find that there are, you know, many economic benefits that Chinese investment in Africa has brought, contributing to macroeconomic growth, providing jobs, and doing so on a scale that's much greater than, you know, Western investment has been in recent years. And I think we can talk more about that. But, you know, those also come with many, many risks and you know, envir- obviously the environmental risks and then social and government's risks. That's exactly why we wanted to write the report and look into those risks at a more project level, at a more granular level. So, Christoph, in the report, we, we, we make the recommendation that there is scope for triangular cooperation between recipient governments, Chinese companies, and Western stakeholders to try and and um, and improve some of the ESG implementation. And, and we've seen recommendations for that, particularly because the ESG monitoring kind of sector is very powerful in Europe and, and in the US. We've seen kind of that those recommendations made over the years. And I think, you know, kind of even, even in, in some cases, cases actually made by African governments. But I was wondering, in, in your experience, to which extent is that actually happening? And to which extent, you know, like the, this, there's always this, this conversation about the potential for triangular cooperation. To which extent is triangular cooperation actually a reality in, 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 the, in these projects? Right. So in, indeed, I think this is a recommendation that is kind of established in, in some ways. So we didn't really come up with, uh, in, in this case, nothing too new. And um, yeah, the goal of the, such triangular coordination and co- cooperation is really to apply more experienced companies to support Chinese companies to improve their ESG standards. Also kind of as an explanation, the idea in this, in this trilateral cooperation is really to co-invest. So it can be a Western financial institution and a Chinese uh, equity provider, or it can be a Chinese and a Western financial organization actually um, having a syndicate and financing a Chinese project. So as long as there is a Western investor um, in there that wants to apply these equator principles, which is, uh, I think, the typical standard of, of Western companies, then kind of the, the standards would be higher also of Chinese projects. So that's the simple thinking behind it. Now, in practice, this is actually more difficult than just kind of saying, let's co-invest. We have some examples where Chinese developers really co-invested with Western financial institutions uh, or equator principal financial institutions or even multilateral development banks where the multilateral development banks like the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank also have very, very high ESG requirements and standards. These projects are fewer than we hope they would be or kind of I'm aware of kind of only a handful of projects. So for example, in Chanatas in in Kazakhstan, there was recently a wind farm that was co-financed by EBRD, the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, um, and some Chinese banks and a Chinese developer. In Pakistan, we have a hydro dam that is co-financed um, with the IFC and developed by a Chinese company. But these examples are few. And again, we're not talking about Chinese suppliers, we're talking really about co-investment and co-developing a project. And one of the reasons, and we did a larger study two years ago about this, is that the standards and the understanding of the standards is often kind of not aligned. So again, we had the ESG standards, the kind of the typical understanding of China, unfortunately, of of Chinese developers is is still often um, that kind of, yes, we do some ES, kind of some environmental and social impact assessment, but the, if the local government tells us it's fine, it's, it still should be fine, 
and kind of we, we muddle our way through, which is also our finding a little bit in, in the case studies that, that we have here, and which is not acceptable for Western companies. But other challenges arise too. One of the really big ones and kind of really challenging ones is conflicts of interest. Chinese companies are very, very large. So there's uh, the large state-owned enterprises that have literally thousands of subsidiaries that ideally all work together because all of the companies, there's a design company, there's a supplier company, there's kind of the overall project developer, and they are ideally all working together, which makes sense on first sight, because then uh, everything comes out of one hand and uh, one hand washes the other. But that's exactly also one of the big concerns of Western financial institutions that want to get involved in such projects, that there is this secret handshake and understanding between different parties uh, in a project that should be kind of at arm's length, meaning there should be clear control and clear separation of responsibility in a project, which is in not the case if uh, everything uh, is colluded, if all the parties work together. Just imagine there's a design company that designs and then there's an the implementation company that implements and constructs everything and there's a mistake. Who's going to be responsible for it? Everybody's trying kind of to hide the mistake because it's in everybody's interest. Whereas if the parties were separate and at arm's length, there should be a clear assignment of responsibility. And this conflict of interest in terms of just governance structure is, for example, one of the um, challenging findings that we had. We had in altogether nine reasons why it's so difficult. But one thing kind of I want to say, what's interesting in um, third party cooperation, which we might see over the next years, is actually not Western financial institutions, but potentially even, for example, Middle Eastern um, financial institutions or state funds that have sovereign wealth funds that have pretty deep pockets are also very experienced and interested in infrastructure development that so instead of the Western companies and Western financial institutions, maybe more aligned countries with China, like Middle Eastern countries, um, might provide more co-financing opportunities, which is unclear in terms of effect for the ESG standards. And I would just add on to the discussion of triangular cooperation that I think it's there's a couple of different levels, you know, representing different extents to which China could engage in triangular cooperation. I think co-financing is one of them, potentially the most important one in terms of determining project outcomes. And we have some forthcoming research um, looking at instances where China co-financed or where a specific Chinese financial institution co-financed with um, one or more other partners. And we're finding that working with international institutions does lead to better environmental outcomes, which is quite interesting, representing the hypothesis that Christoph kind of introduced about the idea of, of learning or kind of rising to the highest standard adopted across the institutions involved. That being said, I think the current level of China sort of directly co-financing is quite low. You know, we were seeing around 15 to 20 percent of the thousands of projects that we looked at were co-financed and not just with international institutions, but co-financing in this case meant, you know, even multiple Chinese institutions working together. So if you're looking at actual co-financing with either an international institution or host country institution, that, that number is even lower, maybe less than 10% of Chinese projects. And so, you know, when used to going it alone, then there's a lot more opportunity for learning if co-financing were to increase in scale. But as I mentioned, I do think there are multiple levels to triangular cooperation and you know, given that China is involved in so many projects as a contractor, I do think it could be quite interesting, maybe for part two of our research together, to look at what happens when you have maybe local or international financiers and then a Chinese contractor and how that contractor may learn or potentially share practices because they are so crucial to those beginning stages of the project. So I think there's a lot of interesting ways to look at triangular cooperation. And there are some examples like the Kipato wind farm, where you know China was involved as a contractor, and then there were co-financiers from the US and other places. And that was in Kenya, where it would be very interesting. I would love to add a case study on that and look at how things are playing out on the ground.
Yeah, absolutely. I think yeah, we should definitely do that. Yeah. Finally, just as a last question, I wonder what kind of recommendations the two of you have for African governments to improve the ESG performance, particularly taking into account how f- how busy they are and how kind of overstretched they are. You know, kind of how how few people they have and how few how few of those people are actually have a, a, a strong background, like a you know kind of in in ESG issues. So, what would be you know concrete and pragmatic ways in which African governments can improve the ESG outcomes. Um, maybe I can start with Christoph and then, and then go to Cecilia at the end. Yeah, I think that's a very good question that in some ways we have been trying to answer and for years and the upgrading of local skills, lo- local capacity to um, improve environmental and social outcomes I think has been on the agenda for, for many years. And there's no Panaika. I think that's how you pronounce it. Excuse my German. What I think the, the tripartite cooperation and kind of ha- having this can, as Cecilia, Cecilia said, take a number of different forms. And it can also just be that in the planning stage, more um, international partners um, can get involved. So it's almost like going to a doctor. If you don't trust one doctor, you take a second opinion. So having this ability to ideally find a second opinion in this as well, it will increase um, project costs, but ideally it will also improve project outcomes and reduce risks. It's always, a, in, in, in some ways, it's always a question of kind of how much finance do you have in terms of paying for that? How much time do you have and do you want to lose? So if you're really in, in, in a hurry, of course, the project will be planned less rigorously and less diligently. And, and then the third uh, question is, of course, in, again, the, the capacity. If there's strong capacity in the country in terms of regulation and an implementation of regulation, it's much easier then there's none. All of these things can be improved, but there's no quick fixes to any of those. But there's, again, hope that um, also the Chinese side will just hopefully improve their standards. One of the things that we always like to stress as well, the local communities, the, the, the civil society should play a very strong role in determining kind of the outcomes and, and, and supporting the project development as well. They usually have a very good understanding kind of what would be environmental issues and, of course, are very much involved in the social issues. So giving the local community a voice through public participation very early on is, I think, one of the important ways to also increase the, not only kind of reduce the risk, but also increase the um, local buy-in to these projects. Yeah, I would just add, I'm really glad that you asked that question, Kobus, because I think you know, one thing we've skipped over a little bit in the conversation is the role of the recipient country actors, especially governments, which may play arguably one of the most important roles in determining ESG impacts. And that's because in some cases, like we mentioned earlier, the host country government is directly responsible for mechanisms like relocation and and compensation. And so, you know, some of our recommendations are, you know, focused directly on, you know, how to build internal capacity and sort of legal and implementation frameworks um, so that ESG standards are, are carried out sort of more effectively on the ground. And I think, you know, Christoph had a, a very comprehensive of list of what we were talking about, you know, improving coordination, you know, improving third party and independent environmental and social impact assessments, you know, providing more transparency from the government to local communities in what kinds of grievance mechanisms are available. I mean, I think in some of our case studies, there were local kind of community to host country government or certain agency channels that were open. But again, coming back to the grievance mechanism up to uh, Chinese institutions, making sure that that is known and how it works and so on, you know, public awareness programs, and then, you know, working, I think, triangularly is potentially um, one of our largest recommendations, you know, across all of the case studies and contexts that we looked at. Cecilia Hanspringer, Christoph Nedepel, thank you so much for joining us today. It was so fun to speak with you. Great to be back and great to talk to you all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Kobus, the most interesting part of the conversation for me was the reference to triangular cooperation. And in the current climate that we're in, That sounds like something that academics would write in a paper, but the reality is so much more complex because just the politics today are not at all aligned with 
Western, Chinese, and African stakeholders working collaboratively together. Do you guys really think that there's a possibility that that could happen? Well, one of the reasons that came up is that there is still ongoing calls also from African stakeholders for that kind of cooperation. So, you know, a while ago, Mozambique did an infrastructure project where they explicitly said that they, were, you know, that they ended up choosing a Chinese contractor for it. And they then farmed out the kind of monitoring and evaluation around ESG issues to a European agency. And, you know, so, so I think for African stakeholders, it kind of makes sense to pull in like a third party into this, you know, because it kind of takes pressure off the African governments that are frequently quite quite overstretched. But it also actually provides a way, like one thing one should keep in mind about ESG issues, like one of the complications of ESG issues is that in a perfect world, it creates this kind of checks and balances, system of checks and balances where, you know, we want to make sure at each, at each stage of the process that it's being implemented well. In reality, in African countries, it has the danger of also creating a, a set of pressure points where, where different kind of stakeholders can try and extract a little personal profit for themselves or where some kind of stakeholder can exert pressure in some kind of way. So bringing in a th some kind of third party to, to deal with some of this helps you to avoid some of those complications as well. And but the, and the thing is, is that that's a field, like ESG implementation just also happens to be a field in which European and American companies are particularly well developed. So that, that, that's just a field, like a, a sector in the economies that is very well developed. So in some ways, it, you know, kind of it, it makes a lot of sense to spin it in this kind of triangular way. The problem, of course, is that it's now so geopoliticized that it's become very difficult to do, actually do it on the ground. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems hard to imagine that that would happen. The other thing that, that jumped out at me is the, the recommendation to enhance domestic capacity and coordination on ESG standards. And that is something that, again, academics might talk about. And maybe academics are leading the way with these ideas that governance will pick up. And, but at the end of the day, in many low governance societies in Africa, and I'm thinking in particularly about Nigeria, Ghana, the DRC, and others, where environmental protection has been the victim of corruption at almost every turn. I mean, we've seen what's happened in Ghana with illegal logging, illegal mining, and illegal fishing that the Ghanaian government has, for the most part, uh, just completely abandoned any effective environmental governance. And, and also in the Republic of Congo, there are widespread reports now of illegal logging, oftentimes done by Chinese stakeholders. And so when we look at the landscape of environmental governance in Africa, it's very diverse. But this idea of enhancing the capacity seems like a very big challenge. Yeah, I mean that that's certainly true. The the issue is also is that that African governments are so overstretched. That so frequently like they don't have any personnel with any background in this issue or they you know kind of it, if they have someone it's two or three people. So corruption doesn't have to be the only problem. You know kind of like it's just frequently like African governments just don't have the hours in the day to also deal with all of these things, particularly if they're also messy and complicated and you have to go out to places and look at things and and so on then then you know it, it, it becomes very very quickly they, they become overwhelmed the problem though is that you know as, as you say academics tend to be these kind of blue sky thought leaders you know <laughs> like that's how they think of themselves and you know so, so that is the kind of job is to, to, to say this is what should happen but the, the problem is also that if African governments don't play a more proactive role in enforcing these things then it becomes much easier for everyone, including Chinese stakeholders, to just really run roughshod over local communities and environments. And that this is what we've seen with this DRC logging that you mentioned, is, you know, there's like an NGO raised this horrifying kind of report about like, like these massive like old growth trees being shipped to China to be, you know, turned into furniture. And then when the Chinese government was confronted with this report, they said, well, you know, like we can't do anything if the DRC government, you know, doesn't ask us to. And of course, the DRC government never does. You know, so 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 it, it's crucial that African governments be more proactive around this because no one else is going to be. And you know, so so yeah, like it's it's not a, it's, it's very far away from a from a good situation. But what do you do when in a number of African countries, and let's be very clear, not all, 
And Africa, again, is a very diverse place, like every continent that size. And again, this is where we run into problems talking about Africa. I mean, what a silly word it is at the end of the day when it's encompassing 54 countries and such diversity. But at the end of the day, it is the shorthand we use. So a number of countries where the leaders do not see their interests aligned with those of their people or their country. Their interests are to stuff their pockets as much as they can. We saw this in Gabon. We've seen it in in the DRC and in any number of places. What can be done to remedy that? There's no easy answer to that question. Kind of what I think a lot of people in the West would say is that you, you need to strengthen in some way civil society that will then, in, you know, kind of increase pressure on these governments, which, yeah, you know, to, to a certain extent, but, but that's also not a clear-cut thing and it takes forever and it might not work. It's a slow process to do that, very, very slow process. Yeah, so in that sense then, you know, kind of the counter-argument is this kind of situation like, like we're seeing with the carbon border, what is it called, C- CBAM, the, the, new, the new initiative coming from the EU, like countries that export to the EU are supposed to share show how much carbon is produced in the supply chain of the product and then they're taxed according to it. So that kind of overarching kind of mechanism is, you know, kind of is, is, a, is a different different way, you know, some kind of like enforced forestry transparency, for example, or, or in the case of these particular projects, you know, kind of like proof that, you know, indigenous populations weren't displaced to build this industrial park. The problem is, is that that then increases, in the first place, of course, it's being pushed by the EU. EU because it's looking for ways to increase European power in the world, you know, kind of which is not something that African countries necessarily want. And it also, you know, could it, it also then means that it, it creates an, an additional bunch of hoops for African economies to jump through and increasing kind of like external kind of leverage on African economies, you know, kind of in, in ways where they're already facing a lot of, of, of non, non-tariff kind of market barriers, you know, too many already. So again, there's no easy answer here it's a very kind of complicated situation but at least where, where, where we are now is, is at a place where even though it's very disputed particularly by like kind of players like the republican party in the u.s esg is at least becoming you know kind of a, a standard that people feel that 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 should be name checked and should be kind of like thought about you know kind of rather than just something something that was on a, on a piece of paper that everyone forgot about The report's title is Elevating ESG, Empirical Lessons on Environmental, Social, and Governance Implementation of Chinese Projects in Africa. This is another one of these benchmark academic reports written by the all-stars in this space. So again, what the United States does not appear to be learning from debt, they should be learning from these things. Don't follow the errors of the American ways here and actually read the research. And this is fascinating research. Congratulations, Kobus, to you and the entire team who worked hard on this report. We're going to put a link to it in the show notes so you can download it and see for yourself all of the fascinating details that they have uncovered. And again, one of the themes that we've talked about over the years on this show is how Chinese companies tend to adapt to whatever level of ESG governance is in that country. Again, we do not see Chinese problems with ESG implementation in Sweden, in Singapore, in Japan, or even in the United States in high governance areas. Where we start to see it is in medium and low governance areas. So it's very interesting to see this research. And again, what's also unusual here is we have researchers from the United States, Europe, Africa, and China participating in this study. So that made it absolutely fascinating. So let's leave the conversation there. If you would like to follow all of the research that we are doing over at the China Global South Project, we've got some great new reports coming up on the nickel supply chain, on quartz, and we're updating our cobalt supply chain. A lot of this is going to be available only to subscribers. We're also launching a new video service coming very soon and new newsletters just for subscribers. So some amazing new things are coming down the line. And if you would like to be a part of what we're doing and to support the work that we are doing that depends on you to support independent journalism in this space, which is becoming so important now in this era of misinformation and disinformation, as we're seeing coming out, of the Middle East right now, just heaps and heaps of it. The work that the team at the China Global South Project is becoming more important by the day, and I'm just so proud of what everybody's doing. And if you'd like to join us and join our community, go to chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. 
You'll get a free 30-day trial just to see if you like it. We hope you'll stay on. And the subscriptions are very, very modestly priced. And if you are a student, you will get half off. Just email me, eric at chinaglobalsouth.com, and I will send you links to 50% off. So for Kobus van Staden in Berlin, I'm Eric Olander in Ho Chi Minh City. We'll be back again next week with another edition of the China Global South podcast. Until then, thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South Project on Twitter at China GS Project and share your thoughts on today's show or head over to our website at chinaglobalsouth.com where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's chinaglobalsouth.com.